So hi, everyone. Thank you all so much for coming to this talk uh, with so many other good ones on at the same time. I'm so happy we've all survived this year. Hope you're all enjoying Strange Loop so far. Uh, it is really so rare this year to, for us to be able to share space and mind space. Uh, so thank you all for making this happen against all the odds. I'm Melinda. And I'm here to talk about distributed systems beyond request response. Uh, this is where I tweet about my partner's Lego. I work at Eggy, uh, where we're working on making table stakes distributed systems accessible to everyone. We're also working on trying to scale carbon capture to gigatons of carbon dioxide per year by 2030. So uh, please talk to me afterward in person or on Slack if you're interested in that. Um, full disclosure, I am currently nursing a brain injury from an unexpected fist fight, so please forgive me if I'm less than articulate these couple days. Uh, and before this year, I worked at Visco and some other places. Um, I had too, fun, too much fun drawing these slides. Sorry, there are no boats in this presentation. So, if we're writing software that touches the internet today, there's no getting around it. We're building a distributed system. Some parts of our software are running on mobile devices or in a web browser, maybe. Some parts are running on the server. Probably many parts are running on many servers. And this is true even if we don't have servers. If we have multiple computing devices and want them to share underlying data in any way, like say by airdropping photos back and forth, uh, to have all of our photos available on some device, that's also a distributed system. And so all of these parts are calling each other over a network, which may or may not be working, uh, might be running out of batteries, might have an exploded hard drive at any point in time. But our software is expected to stay up and running perfectly, even though any of its parts might be gone. That's difficult. Internet-based software is inherently distributed, and distributed systems are difficult to design, build, understand, and operate. But it is totally manageable if we understand the constraints of this context, and if we build the tools to make this tractable, if we build the ways of reasoning to make this context feel natural. When we build distributed systems, we're designing for three main concerns. First, reliability, how to make sure that the system continues to work correctly and performantly. Second, maintainability, how to make sure that all the different people who are going to work on our system over time can understand and work on it productively. And three, scalability, how to make sure that we have reasonable ways to deal with their systems as they grow. Maybe I should just, yeah. But one overarching concern uh, with all of this is how we keep complexity under control. When we start building something, it can be really simple, delightful, clean, but other projects get bigger, they often become complex and really difficult to understand. And this complexity slows down everyone who eventually needs to work on the system. We end up with tangled dependencies, hacks, or special casing to work around problems, an explosion in how much state we're keeping. I'm sure you've all seen these things. And one way that we try to manage complexity that's been uh, in vogue in our industry in the last few years is by breaking our software down into independently deployable services. This does have many advantages. Services can be worked on in parallel. Each service can focus on a single domain. We have flexibility in how we solve larger problems and so on. But these things are only true if we decompose our software in the right way and use patterns that fit our context. If we aren't careful, we could end up with software that's still tightly coupled, but now also has an unreliable network between each piece of business logic. And it's hard to deploy, impossible to debug. Okay, so why is this? Uh, I posit that one key property of our software architecture is the basic interaction style that we choose. Like how our microservices interact with each other. Because we've broken our software down into pieces now, our system only works when multiple services work together. And the default way that we typically do interaction nowadays is request response using synchronous network calls. So in this model, we try to make requests to a remote network service look like calling functions in a programming language within the same process. This seems really convenient at first, 
But seeing remote calls as function calls is fundamentally flawed. Because a network request is really different from a local function call. A local function call is predictable and either succeeds or fails, depending on parameters that are totally under our control. But a network request is unpredictable. It could return successfully, albeit much more slowly than a function call. Uh, it could return successfully, but way more slowly than that. Uh, the network could be congested, or the remote service could be overloaded, so it might take 20 seconds or five minutes to do the exact same thing. The requester response could get lost due to a network problem, or the remote service could be unavailable, or we could hit a timeout without receiving a result, and we would have no idea what happened. If we don't receive a response from our remote service, we have no way of knowing whether the request got through or not. Maybe the requests are actually getting through, for example, and only the responses are getting lost. So it's probably not safe for us to retry it unless we've built in a mechanism for deduplication. This is a really rough environment to be in, really different from running on a single computer. And because of this, our distributed systems, uh, our distributed software uh, that interacts using request response can be incredibly hard to reason about. Let's imagine uh, that, uh, unlike this slide, we have on the order of 100 or 1,000 services communicating with each other in this point-to-point -point way. Imagine how many different point-to-point -point connections that is. And this is what a large distribu distributed service architecture can look like. This is um, a, a central streaming service and sponsor Netflix's architecture, circa 2015, the series of lines on the right from a reInvent talk showing a network of services and their synchronous runtime dependencies on other services. Some people refer to this representation as a Death Star diagram. <laughs> we can see that as the number of services grows over time, the number of synchronous interactions grows with them somewhere between linearly and quadratically. And if we zoom into one service, this was the call graph for a single Netflix service from the same talk. Sorry to keep talking about this one example from 2015, it just had nice diagrams. Uh, this was the list of list of movie service, and these were all the services that it had to talk to in order to return a response. We can see that this one service depends on many other ones, and that any of these end dependencies being down, if they're critical to the service, can cause availability issues for our one service. And apart from just availability, we have latency, which grows with the depth of the dependency graph. We probably need to coordinate read times between when each of these is querying a status store. And we are likely just going to find it extremely difficult to reason about the state of the system at any point in time. There's a lot going on. So much so that the only reasonable approach is often not to reason about this dependency graph at all and just work just work to make every dependency significantly more available than necessary. Um, as noted in this paper, a service can't be more available than the intersection of all of its critical dependencies. So for example, if we want our service to offer 99.99% availability, we can just make our critical dependencies much more than 99.99% available. Uh, and this approach is discussed in depth in this paper from engineers at Google. That, that's one option. Or we could wait and see how the system performs in practice and diagnose issues as they arise, which in practice is very fun, like a murder mystery. Uh, it's fun because it entails digging through tons of complexity, sometimes while a pager is going off next to me. But it's, let's say, suboptimal. We can also do things to protect our, response, uh, our request response services, like say, let's make automatic request retries when we don't get a response back with back pressure. We can add caches in between clients and servers. We can have multiple redundant copies of services that can take requests when only one copy is broken with readiness and liveness checks that route to the right ones. I should stop moving my hands. Dynamic service uh, discovery, load balancing, circuit breaking, thing, service meshes like Linkerd and Istio to make this more transparent to the user. Distributed tracing, these are all standard patterns for software that runs on the internet, the soft for software that runs in the cloud. But these are standard patterns we, which we take for granted because trusting request response to work in a hostile environment like the cloud is inherently risky. And so much of the mindshare in the microservices landscape 
the libraries, the tooling, the documentation, blog posts, the books, diagrams, it assumes this model of services calling each other synchronously. And I think it's just a little unfortunate that we so often conflate the core values and goals of microservices with a specific model, request response, for their implementation. This is also a hostile environment. But what if, instead of patching these solutions for resilience on top of request response, we could change the problem to a simpler one by just not binding our services together with synchronous ties. Um, I see this as analogous to the divide between imperative and functional programming. The request response model of service communication matches our sequential imperative programming model of making in-place state changes on a single computer. And we've seen how that isn't perfectly suited for a distributed environment. Functional programming, in contrast, describes behavior in terms of the immutable input and output values of pure functions, not in terms of mutating objects in place. If we model the way our services communicate, zooming way out, more functionally, what would our systems look like? And we've seen in the past few years how thinking about things in a more functional way helps in other parts of the stack. On the web, we've had reactive frameworks like React and Redux and Vue and Elm, which you'll hear about here as well before that, uh, that almost everyone has shifted to after seeing how they can simplify things. On mobile, the newest generation of UI frameworks on both iOS and Android is functional and reactive, and we've had libraries for reactivity and business logic for a long time. Um, on the infrastructure side, we've really seen how declarative APIs like Kubernetes, infrastructure as code tools like Terraform, and deployment via Git make things much easier to reason about. But I think we're still early in adopting this in backend application development. What would it look like if we extended this functional programming analogy to a microservices architecture? This is the idea behind event-driven architecture. Like functional programming, sorry, event-driven architecture lets us know consistently the state of a system as long as we know its input events. So there are lots of different, different definitions of the details of what can be called an event-driven system, but the common piece is that the thing that triggers code execution in an event-driven system doesn't wait for any response. It just sends it and then forgets about it. So in this diagram on the left, you can see a request and response. When a re request is received, the receiving server has to return some kind of response to the client. So that means both the client and the server have to be alive, healthy, and focusing on each other in order for this to work. On the, on the other hand, on the right, there's an event-driven service. The service that consumes the event still does something with it, yes, but it doesn't have to send any response to the thing that originally created the event that triggered it. Only this one service has to be alive for this code to be run. It doesn't depend on other services being there. It's not coupled to the thing that produced the event. It doesn't have to know about the producer at all. In an event-driven service, we are centering the transformation, functional-ish, not the interaction in a stateful way. And the way that this usually looks in practice is that we use a message broker or a distributed log to store these events. These days, this is usually a distributed, a partition distributed log like Kafka or Kinesis or something similar. Um, events can be split into different streams called topics, which then get partitioned across a horizontally scalable cluster. Each of our services can then consume from one or more topics, produce from one or more topics, or do both or neither. And when we compose many of these event-driven services together and have them respond to inputs from the outside world, this makes up a reactive, a whole reactive system. But so, moving to an event-driven, more functional and data-centric model is a really different way of having programs interact with each other. And if we're going to make this change, we'd better have some really good reasons. The biggest reason, I think, uh, for making this change is the decoupling and easy composability, the modularity that this gives us. By getting rid of these point-to-point -point synchronous flows, our system can become much simpler. Instead of having, to, having the work to add things scale, scale quadratically-ish like this, 
because every new thing has to be hooked up to every existing thing. It becomes a much simpler task to plug new services in or change services that are already there. We can break these long chains of blocking commands where one piece being down at any given time means all of these are unavailable. And again, we do this by using a distributed log, a partitioned append-only log that all producers and consumers use as a central pipeline that provides strong ordering semantics and durability guarantees. And zooming out to a whole organization, these design principles let us build composable systems at a really large scale. In a large org, different teams can independently design and build services that consume from topics and produce to new topics. Since a topic can have any number of independent consumers, no coordination is required to set up a new consumer. And consumers can be deployed at will or built with different technologies, be it different languages or libraries or different data stores even. Each team just focuses on making their particular part of the system do its job well. So as a real life example, this is how this worked at Visco, where I worked before this year. Uh, Visco is a photo and video sharing consumer platform where users have their own profile and can follow each other and so on, a social network. Uh, what happens if a user follows another user in the app? Well, the first thing that happens is that they hit a synchronous follow service, uh, which then tries to get that information about the follow into the distributed log, Kafka, as soon as possible. And once it's there, it can be used for many things. It gets consumed by this feed found out worker so that the follower can get the followees posts injected in their feed. It gets consumed by the push notification pipeline so the followee can see that you've gotten a new follower and so on. Each of these downstream services has either one or several defined input message types and a defined output message type or types. And the key is that we can keep on plugging more consumers. We could add monitoring so we can see if the rate of follows gets way down and business metrics might be affected by some change in our app design or something like that. Or if it goes way up in case something weird is going on. We could add an abuse prevention mechanism to see if something weird is going on. We could add analytics in case we need to report to Wall Street or something and so on. All of these systems can be developed independently and connected and composed in a way that is and feels robust. And just as functional languages let us divide a large problem into sub-problems and sub-sub-problems, then combine these, uh, then combine these problem solutions together to solve the original problems and other ones. Using event-driven services lets us glue granular functions together in flexible ways. We can localize knowledge about the details of each computation in analogy to higher order functions, and we can perform a computation exactly and only as needed, uh, because an event is created only when something changes, which is kind of analogous to lazy evaluation. In contrast, in a request response system, we might need to pull a service dependency and have it perform a query, say, a thousand or a million times in order to receive a single change. A side benefit of this is that we get asynchronous flows for free. So often, there are computations that even in the request response system, we would want to happen outside the user, user path or even more infrequently, like, say, an hourly or daily batch job. It used to be that we'd need to do a bunch of orchestration to set up batch jobs with, say, Airflow or Luigi or something like that. But if we handle the real-time case with events, then our offline jobs are just like any other consumer, and they work by default. And this functional composition makes things easier to debug and trace as well. So uh, by the definition of event-driven service that we've made, we have a central, immutable, and saved journal of every interaction and its inputs and outputs. So we can go back and see exactly where something failed. To get this with request response, we'd have to invest lots of time and energy in a full distributed tracing system. And even then, it's really hard to see where latencies might be hidden. Another reason that event-driven systems are helpful is that in, in many ways they can provide scale by default and make some of the patterns that we use for resilience in request response service architectures unnecessary. So for example, um, as we saw earlier, uh, 
the distributed log really can act as a buffer if the recipient is unavailable or uh, overloaded. It will automatically redeliver messages to a process that's crashed. It can prevent messages from being lost. And so this makes something like retries with back pressure and health checks less necessary. Uh, the log prevents the sender from needing to know the IP address and port number of the recipient, which is particularly useful in, say, a cloud environment where servers go up and down all the time. And so it makes complex service discovery and load balancing much less necessary. A fifth, fifth, okay. Uh, if we're running an application today, we are very likely to want to use several different data storage systems or databases to serve different use cases. Uh, there's no single one-size-fits-all database that's able to fit all the different access patterns efficiently. Uh, this is sometimes called polyglot persistence. So for example, we might need users to perform a keyword search on a data set, and so we'll need a full-text search index service like Elasticsearch. Uh, we might need a specialized database like a scientific or graph database to do specialized data structure traversals, say, or filters. We might have a data warehouse for business analytics where we need a really different storage layout, like say, a column-oriented storage engine. We have all of these things. When new data gets written, how do we make sure that it ends up in all the right places? We could write to all the databases from synchronous microservices, dual writes, triple, quadruple, quintuple writes, but we've seen how that is fragile. And it's impossible to make dual rights consistent without distributed transactions. And you can read about all of this in detail in this paper from Martin Kleppmann and collaborators. A more provably correct way of doing this, though, is with event-driven systems. Um, there are two main patterns that I've tried using uh, that we can choose from to do this in an event-driven way. Uh, first, we could do this with database change capture, which is a database-first approach. Or we could do this with event sourcing, which is an event-first approach. Um, the database change capture pattern is the one that I've used more often in practice, um, and it's really based on an old idea. Uh, the idea is that we let applications subscribe to a stream of everything that's written to a database, inserts, updates, deletes, um, and then we can use that feed to do the things listed earlier. We can update search indices, we can invalidate caches, we can create snapshots, so on and so forth. There are open source libraries that uh, help get this feed of every database change for different databases into a distributed broker like Kafka, where consumers can access it. For example, um, the most well known is probably Debezium, which uses Kafka Connect. And databases are increasingly started, starting to support these change streams as a first party interface. Um, at Visco, because we started doing this back in 2016, before there were common tools for this, we wrote our own Go service called Audubon to get this database change feed into Kafka by tailing the MySQL binary log and MongoDB op log directly. Um, and we use something similar for our relational databases at Iggy. Uh, but going back to the follows use case for a social network, um, the way that the event gets into the distributed log in the first place uh, with database change capture is that the follow service writes to an online transactional database, say something like MySQL or MongoDB. Then our database change capture service writes every change in that database to the distributed log, where then any number of consumers can do whatever they want with it. Sidebar, this ends up being a really nice way to migrate off of a monolith. We can let the monolith keep doing the initial database write, suck those writes into our event store with database change capture, and then pull out all the reads and the extra stuff that the monolith does for every write into composable workers reading off of the event store. And this helps us fix one of the most common pitfalls in microservice architecture, where we, have, we, where we do have a bunch of independently deployable services, but they all share a single database. Um, where this kind of broad shared contract really makes it hard to figure out what effects any changes might have and negates the advantages of having a microservices architecture. We would much rather not have our data be so coupled, but it's hard to unbundle it at that point. Database change capture can make it much easier. We can also save even richer data with event-driven systems if we want to. So, uh, writing data directly to the log can produce better quality data than if we just update a database. For example, if someone adds an item to their shopping cart and then removes it again, we are buying furniture here, 
those add and delete actions do have informational value. And if we lose that information from the database when a customer removes an item from the cart, we've just thrown away information that might have been used, useful for analytics or recommenders or any other systems. Um, and this approach, where we write events first and directly to the distributed log, is usually given the name event sourcing, which comes originally from the domain-driven design community. So like database change capture, event sourcing involves saving all the changes to the application state as a log of change events. But instead of letting one part of the application use the database in a mutable way and update and delete records uh, as it likes, in event sourcing, our application logic is explicitly built on the basis of immutable events. And that event store is purely append only. Usually, updates or deletes are discouraged or prohibited. And then, if we want to get a copy of our current working tree, we'd aggregate over all the diffs over time. So in a fully event source system, the current state is derived. Uh, both this and the mutable version are valid approaches, but they come with slightly different trade-offs in practice. Uh, regardless of which one we use, the important thing is to save facts as they're observed in an event log. Um, in practice, I haven't personally used this pattern as much as the database first change capture approach because the combination of fast trans transaction protected state updates and totally ordered downstream effects has been hard to beat. Um, but the event sourcing approach is just as valid if we have different design constraints and probably more theoretically beautiful. And one thing that falls out of all of these other reasons uh, is that this makes integrating machine learned logic very, very straightforward. So nowadays, we often want to plug machine learnable programs into different parts of our software where we can get better results than by hand coding some program. And this will be increasingly true in the future. Let's say uh, that we want to decide on the fly whether our request is from a legitimate actor or, I don't know, send a user through a different onboarding flow depending on how they behave or tune a database index as new data of different shapes come in, comes in, whatever the ML uh, application is. Inserting ML like this uh, will really not be tractable if we do this in a point-to-point -point request response way. Many of us have probably been asked to insert a machine learning inference step into an existing system and had to build a ton of hacky infra around it to get it to work, which is frustrating and not scalable. Our software just becomes totally incomprehensible. But if we've already switched to using an event-driven system, we have pluggable data integration points already there for us. And adding ML is just adding another consumer or producer. And last, and this is more speculative, but is it? But where I hope we can take this one day is can we thread this all the way through to the clients? Uh, right now, clients usually have to pull for changes to find out when something they've loaded has changed. So the fastest that we can possibly get an update is the polling interval of the clients, which is usually probably too long to work for any low latency use cases. But if we can thread event-driven architecture end to end, which we almost have the right tooling for, um, then we can push these event-driven notifications all the way through the stack to the browser or the mobile app or the forklift or the sail drone or whatever. If we do that, then we won't ever have to see stale data anymore and we won't need to pull every second. With all of that said, there are some things to watch out for when you're building your event-driven systems. One key decision is how you want to structure your event data. Since the events are now our input and output interface, the way that our request and response types were our interface, it were our interface in a request response system. So our systems do and will change over time as features are added and changed inevitably. And we'll need to handle backward and forward compatibility in order to make sure we can update to newer versions without breaking our applications. Um, just like with request response, we'll likely want to use a schema language with evolvability rules and, this is my bias, compiler checking of constraints like protocol buffers, Avro, or Thrift, something like this. 
Um, at Eggy, we use protocol buffers plus a custom CodeGen plugin that lets us define input and or output types for each of our event-driven services. These types generate bindings that then handle the standard order functionality, check constraints, let us write tests, et cetera, et cetera. Kind of like gRPC, but for asynchronous services instead of synchronous ones, um, which if there's any interest in, we can throw on GitHub. I would really just recommend using some typed data serialization system here where we can ensure safe schema evolution in a developer-friendly way and not trying to manage these changes on top of JSON or XML or something like that. Um, another piece is concurrency management. So say we now have distributed data management. How do we make sure that we read all of the implications of our rights? What the event-driven service approach guarantees us is that every event will eventually be processed by every consumer, even if there are crashes. But there's no guarantee about the upper bound uh, until, uh, of time until an event is processed, which means that our data stores will eventually converge on a consistent state, but they might be inconsistent when they're read at one point in time. Request response doesn't exactly solve this problem either, but it's much more obvious when we're using an event-based approach, and we have to design explicitly for this eventual consistency. In our event-based systems also, we depend heavily on this distributed log to provide strong semantics around total ordering. Distributed logs do this really well, but we have to be careful about how we structure and partition our logs in order to scale without losing ordering. Um, in particular, uh, with a distributed log, with a distributed partition log, there's a trade-off between using a single partition for a topic, which limits the total scalability of the system, sorry, uh, but guarantees total ordering within the topic. Um, between that and breaking the topic into independent partitions by entity, which guarantees ordering within an entity's events, but not ordering between them, between entities. And if we know that our data model is more complex and can be handled with a single partitioning key, we also can handle interactions between partitions by breaking them down into multiple event processing stages. And related to that, uh, when we're building event-driven systems, we do have to consider the notion of identity of our entity I, of the identity of our entities very carefully. Uh, all of our messages need to be uniquely identified in order to say, detect duplicates, implement optimistic concurrency control, manage deletes, and so on. In general, the event-driven approach does require more upfront design, but gives us this payoff of lower cognitive load and simpler changes in the future, the way of the future. That, that's at least in my experience. And just like in request response systems, privacy and data deletability are critical, given GDPR, CCPA, and other privacy regulations, and also just doing right by our users. When we delete a single piece of data, we want to make sure that we, want, that we can delete all the pieces of data derived from it, which might now be in many data stores. Event-driven processing can make it easier to perform this deletion because all, it's all just consumers on consumers, uh, but it might also make it more likely that we have more data to delete. And with all of these decisions, we need to make sure that we don't conflate the underlying fundamentals with the tools that we choose. It's not about Kubernetes or Kafka. Tools and frameworks change quickly, but the fundamentals stay mostly-ish the same. The biggest gotcha with this, though, although it's becoming less and less true, is that event-driven interactions are not the norm yet. And so there are just fewer libraries and tools and blog posts and example repos about this than about request response architecture. But many things that we use and appreciate today weren't the default a few years ago either, and we've seen now how they've made our lives easier. Um, now, I didn't have time to show a demo of this here, uh, but I really wanted to, so I put one up at this link. Uh, there's code and a short video, almost lightning length. It's a full stack web and backend breakfast delivery service. It doesn't actually deliver you breakfast, sorry. With two different architectures, First, request response microservices, then event-driven microservices. Uh, check it out if you don't already have an event-driven system and you want to try to run one or just see one running or if you're just interested in breakfast. <laughs> um, and if you're interested in lunch, I'll let you go now. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs>